So at this point, I'm going to introduce Janelle Bennett. She is the community health worker for the Share Network with whom we're partnering uh, for this presentation. And she is going to tell us a brief bit about the Share Network and introduce our speaker and topic today. So Janelle, uh, over to you. All righty. Thank you so much, Barbara. And good afternoon. Yes, it's officially afternoon now. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for being here today and for um, having us and for this present the opportunity to provide this presentation to you all. As Barbara shared, my name is Janelle Bennett, and I am the community health worker for the Share Network. So that simply means I'm that liaison, that bridge between Share Network and the community. And my role is to really keep my ear to the community and know the needs of older adults and anyone that supports the health of older adults so that then we can help to support those needs. At Share Network, we have a focus of making sure that anything pertaining to the healthy aging of older adults is met within the community. So we know do that. Right? We do that by providing free resources Shumple. and educational programs, primarily on the south side of Chicago, but also in surrounding areas. And we do this in a number of ways, one by educating geriatricians and other clinicians by providing free healthy aging educational programs, such as the one today. And those are all on topics pertaining to healthy aging of older adults. And then also just by connecting within the community. So such as at health fairs or even coming to a drop-in such as this. So everyone here, I believe, is about age 55 or older. And if you're not, if you know someone who is, well, then that's exactly who we want to be in touch with. And we're here to serve that population. We can do that through our website. You can contact us or stay connected to us through our website, through our monthly newsletter. And then also you can stay abreast of resources that we offer through our Healthy Aging Resource Guide. So by a show of hands, how many of y'all are familiar with our handy dandy book, our, our resource guide? All righty. That's a good amount of people. It's like half the group. So. Here's an example of what it looks like. You may have seen this within the community. If not, you can um, find one through Lucas, I'm sure it can provide you with a copy. It has a wealth of resources that pertain to older adults. So things such as staying connected with technology. You all are in here, Chicago High Park Village. Um, finding a new doctor, things of that nature you can find in our Healthy Aging Resource Guide. There's also an electronic version. So if you want to be able to share it with others immediately or look for resources immediately, you can do that through the link. I will make sure to post access to our newsletter, our website, and that resource guide in a moment. I'll post that in the chat for you all. But before we go into the presentation, I'd like to introduce Dr. Landy. Dr. Justine Landy will present to us today. It's my honor to be able to introduce her. Dr. Landy is a triple board certified physician in family medicine, geriatrics, and palliative and hospice medicine. Dr. Landy is currently working as a physician at the University of Chicago, where she cares for older adults and for those facing serious illnesses in the hospital, home, clinic, and nursing home settings. Dr. Landy provides comprehensive care for older adults with the focus on the management of multiple medical conditions, the care of older adults having surgery, the care of older adults who have problems with alcohol and opioids, and the care of older adults in nursing homes. So without any further wait, I will hand it over to Dr. Landy. Thank you, Janelle, I appreciate that. Um, thank you everyone for attending. I will be talking about one of our 4M's topics, which is the mind and aging. And so we'll get that PowerPoint shared here. Let's see. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen, if that's OK. Thanks, Tiffany. OK. Okay. 
looking at this because we're at the end. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we'll be talking about the mind and aging. This is a two-part series. So here's part one. Next slide. And then we'll jump to the next one. We just spoke about the shared yep. network. So yeah. Right. Perfect. Okay. So where what when we talk about the four M's, what we're talking about is this framework. It's called the age-friendly health system. So hospitals, clinics um, can be uh, certified as age-friendly health systems. And this idea is that the care of older adults is focused on the four M's. Um, and it's the focus on mobility, what matters, medications, and mentation. So um, our educational series is split into these four main topics, and today we'll be focusing on mentation. Next slide. Okay. Um, and uh, you don't have to go to the slide before, but the slide before, so when we think about mentation, we think about uh, three different areas. We think about depression and anxiety. We'll add those together, depression. There's delirium. Um, which is the confusion that can occur suddenly, whether someone's sick or in the hospital. Sorry, my pager's going off. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Um, and, uh, and dementia. So more of the long-term progression of memory problems. We'll be focusing on depression today, um, as well as anxiety. And so on this slide, um, all of these folks have something in common. Um, and so this is you know, The Rock, Halle Berry, Jim Carrey, Serena Williams, Michael Phelps, even Abraham Lincoln. Um, and uh, just to cut to the chase, they all struggle with depression. It's, it's very common. Um, it can happen to anyone. Um, and there are ways that we can address it. And so that's what we'll be talking about. Next slide. All right, so depression. Depression is a mood disorder, um, but it's more than just feeling sad or down or blue. There are actual physical manifestations of depression. There are cognitive manifestations. So we can feel physical symptoms from depression and even our mind, the way we're thinking, our memory can be impacted by, um, by depression. Next slide. So I think what's really important, and this actually goes for a lot of things. I spend most of my clinic days talking about this. I spend most of my time with uh, residents, medical students talking about this. Just because something is common does not mean that it's normal in aging. Um, and so yes, depression is common in older adults, but it is not a normal part of aging. Prevalence and something being um, abnormal or normal are very different things. Um, and in reality, men and women over the age of 65 appear to have lower rates of severe depression compared to the rest of the population, supporting this statement that it's not normal. Um, and there's actually, you know, some thought that the true rate uh, actually may be higher in older adults because a lot of older adults may not talk about it um, or their providers aren't asking them about it. Um, your healthcare provider may not realize you're suffering from depression um, if you have not mentioned it and they're maybe not thinking about asking about it, whether it's sadness or grief. Um, and then there are just some people who don't like to talk about it. Um, we know that depression can be triggered by common chronic, so long-term medical conditions that older adults often face. Um, and so that could be like diabetes, Parkinson's, arthritis, so osteoarthritis, um, heart failure, cancer, if someone's had a heart attack or stroke, this all, oh, sorry, um, this all puts, you at increased, uh, puts someone at increased risk of depression. About one in four people uh, with medical conditions develop depression that may need treatment at some point. And I think the thing to really focus on is that there's something that we can do about it. So depression is a treatable illness. And so you'll have a better chance at recovery if you talk to your healthcare provider about how you're feeling so that your depression can be properly managed along with your physical condition. Next slide. 
Okay. So before we, that's, that's okay. So, um, so I was going to ask like, what's, thank you. <laughs> Maybe no one saw it. Um, what are some, what are some symptoms that you can think of and write it in the chat, raise your hand, call out. Um, what are some symptoms of depression that, that some of you are aware of? Lack of motivation. Lack of motivation, exactly. What else? What else do people feel or experience? Would crying a lot be one of it? Say that one more time. Crying often. Yeah, absolutely, right? The, the emotions that come with it. Mm -hmm. Changes in your eating patterns. Yes, yeah. So people's appetite are very much linked to how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. And it can be less or more, right? Some people, when they're when they're in a depressive state, can can eat more than they typically do. But some people actually may lose their appetite altogether, and that's when we start to see weight loss as well. <laughs> Not feeling like participating in uh, normal activities. Exactly. I think that ties into two. Um, one was the motivation, but also this idea of losing interest. This is a big one. The fact of losing interest in things that you previously found enjoyable. Yeah. Yes. Kathy, you're muted if you're trying to. That's okay. Um, as Lucas indicated, sleep disturbance. Yes, sleep. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry, I'm. I'm trying to. Well, that's okay. I, I'm. The I, chat too. That's a. That's a biggie that I'm. I'm aware of. Absolutely, sleep. Um, drink. Yes, alcohol drinking. Um, isolating. Being. Yeah, it's completely like your world kind of closes in. Um, and then maybe one obvious sign telling people you're feeling depressed. Yeah, right. Like just feeling that. Um, thank you. This was all hit a lot of the, the areas. Um, we'll go ahead and advance the slide. That way you can see some of some other ones. Um, so we talked about sad, sadness, the emotions with it, hopelessness, guilty, feeling worthless or helpless, um, not participating, right? Like we talked about in those activities you once enjoyed, um, weight gain or weight loss, sleep, um, and then also there's a component of like just not thinking clearly, um, either indecisive, not having good concentration or focus, short-term memory impacted. Um, some other ones that um, are not listed here uh, are also like personality changes. Uh, we said memory changes. Um, Oh, there's also this idea of like, uh, when I talk to people, sometimes they just feel like the world is moving a lot faster around them. Um, so just like, just really just slow in all of the movements and their, and their activities, or maybe the opposite, they're restless and more agitated than normal. And a big one is that feeling of fatigue and that loss of energy, even though like, you're like, I went to sleep just fine, but I wake up and every day I'm just exhausted. So those are all things that, that you could ex be experiencing um, if you have depression. Next slide. Okay, so before we go and list those out, so the, the key about this, and this is really common in most medical conditions, it's, you know, it's not possible, but, you know, oftentimes something is not just from one cause, and this is very true for depression. Um, and so it's often not from one thing. Researchers think that there are many factors that could contribute. And so it's usually a combination of, of many things. So we'll list them out right here on the slide. Um, but it's a combination of chronic diseases and conditions versus like life situations. And it's, it's, really then when we talk about treatment here in a moment, it really highlights the fact that it's probably not going to be one thing to, for, as a treatment that's going to help because it's, you have to tackle it from many different areas because it's caused by many different things. Um, if we can go ahead and advance that slide. Yeah. One more. Beautiful. Okay. So here is, here are the life situations and the chronic disease conditions. So life situations, if there was a death of a relative or a friend, um, loss of a job or retirement, um, loneliness and social isolation. That has been a huge aspect of COVID for a lot of my patients is the impact that COVID has had 
on their mental health because of the isolation. Um, if someone's been hospitalized or they've been uh, recently uh, moved to a nursing facility, whether it's for short-term, for rehabilitation, or perhaps for long-term, and maybe not even moving to a nursing facility, but moving from like an independent apartment to assisted living or assisted living to a nursing home. I think those changes can be can be quite powerful for someone. Um, there's also the, the chronic illnesses that someone faces, disability, other stresses in life. Um, and then because of some medical conditions, it may be hard to get good sleep because of frequent urination, or maybe there's chronic pain, um, something else from a medical standpoint that's, that's getting in the way of your sleep, which then affects your mood. Um, and then from a chronic disease standpoint, thyroid disorders can affect uh, someone's mood, vitamin deficiencies, alcohol and drug use, which was brought up earlier, um, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and just if someone's facing a serious illness, um, and long-term pain. Chronic pain and mood are so interconnected. So not only does chronic pain impact someone's mood, but also if somebody has depression or anxiety, it can certainly contribute to the pains that they're feeling because pain is an emotional and physical um, experience. We can't take the emotional part emotional part out of, of the pain experience. And then also it could honestly be a side effect of some medications. Um, so these are all just helping uh, paint the picture that this is very multifactorial. Next slide. Okay. So when we think about major depression, we've talked a lot about the physical illness component, how it's associated with physical illness. Um, many older adults face at least one medical condition. And um, it's also very prevalent for older adults to face multiple medical conditions, be on multiple medications, uh, perhaps have, have been had to go to the hospital or the emergency room, maybe having to go to a rehab facility after. So just the, the fact of having chronic medical conditions puts a person, not even an older adult, but a person at risk of dementia. And the diagnosis of dementia in someone who's physically ill is can be a little bit complicated because there's a lot of overlap. But no matter what, when the symptoms are disabling, the treatment should be offered. If we go to the first one when it comes to dementia, so depression associated with dementia, sometimes, again, there, there's a lot of overlap between the symptoms of depression and the symptoms of dementia. And so they, there are some symptoms of depression that are similar to those of dementia. So this is a reason why someone who has signs of depression should talk to, and I encourage you to talk to your healthcare provider, because it may be also worth evaluating memory as well. And then there's depression associated with bereavement. So as we get older, we're more likely to face loss of family and friends. And when you lose someone that you deeply care about, you're at increased risk of becoming depressed. Now, grief is a completely normal and appropriate response. However, when major, depre major depression is when that grief response is out of proportion to or lasts longer than or impacts your life far more than one would expect. Um, and so prolonged grief should for definitely be brought up uh, to your to your provider. Next slide. So like I said, there are treatment options for depression. Um, I, I often advocate for both um, therapy, talk therapy. There are many different types of therapy um, out there. A common one that people talk about is cognitive behavioral therapy, but there are so many ways to address someone's depression um, as well as with antidepressants. And sometimes we do need the help of an antidepressant to help maximize someone's benefit from the therapy itself. Next slide. Okay. And so um, I just want to shift gears to uh, anxiety. Oftentimes we talk about depression and anxiety together. They can often coexist, um, but anxiety and stress. So stress happens every day, right? We can't escape stress. Stress is an everyday response um, to life experiences and that, but it may cause us to feel anxious and that's normal. Like we need that as a human to notice something that can create a stress response so that we can respond appropriately to know something's dangerous or what have you. That's normal. What's not normal is the excessive worry or anxiety that lasts a long time or gets worse over time or is impacting this someone's day-to-day -day life. And so I think if it's um, the, the, the trend in, in this, at least, and a lot of 
conditions when it comes to mood disorders is there are normal responses, sadness, there are normal responses to stress and anxiety, but when it becomes problematic and it's actually impacting your everyday life, that's when, that's when we need to start treating. Next slide. Okay. So um, if you're worry, if you worry excessively, if your anxiety is making it more difficult to function, right? This is that part when it's problematic in your life. If you're having trouble functioning, low motivation, which can happen with anxiety too, not wanting to leave the house, changing the way that you eat, losing weight, um, more isolation, um, then that this would be a reason to talk to your provider, especially if your anxiety is getting worse over time and if you're not able to sleep. Um, and so when you talk to your provider, just as like more of a heads up. So if you talk to your provider about this, they're most likely going to dive into asking you about more symptoms that you're experiencing. They're going to review your medical history. They're going to review your medications and they're going to ask you, you know, things that maybe have changed recently, um, uh, from, from what we call social history. So um, substances that someone's consuming, family events. So they're really gonna try to, to have a comprehensive assessment of this. Um, they'll, they will consider whether the anxiety is related to a medical condition. So sometimes someone may feel anxious because they have a heart condition, a heart arrhythmia where it's beating so fast and that will, by the way the body works will make you feel anxious. Um, so there may also be blood tests involved, urine tests involved. There may be imaging depending on the history to better understand the source of anxiety. Um, and then lastly, that medication review is important. It can, medications can cause symptoms that are similar to anxiety. So uh, asthma medications can do this. So albuterol inhalers can speed up the heart rate, can make someone feel anxious right after using it. Um, thyroid medications, right? So if someone's trying to correct hypothyroidism, a, a slow thyroid um, or an underactive thyroid, that medicine, um, if as you're trying to get the right level of it, it may actually make you feel more anxious. Um, if someone is taking steroids by mouth, so not that necessarily the steroid injections into joints, but if someone's swallowing steroids for their lung condition or their joint condition, um, that can make someone feel anxious and, um, and nervous. So your, your provider will want to review those medications, but also wanting to review all of your over-the-counter medications. Um, there are a lot of supplements and over-the-counter medications that can be problematic when combined with either your condition, age, or medications. Next slide. Okay. So how do we manage this? Um, and I really like this, this list here. And actually I have a version of this for chronic pain as well as for mood and clinic, where I will take out the sheet of paper and we will go through it um, because it's going to take multiple um, multiple treatments um, and, and from different areas, whether it's medicines, talk, diet, um, uh, exercises, you name it to address this. Cause again, it's a, it's coming from multiple causes. So we have to tackle it in multiple ways. Um, so we already talked about, uh, talk therapy. Some people find a lot of comfort in support groups. Um, there should be a, a focus on diet as well. So reducing caffeine intake, particularly if you're, uh, if you're anxious, switching to uh, decaffeinated beverages may help also just trying to eat as, as well as you can, um, can just be helpful, obviously for the mind, but all our body, but also for the mind. Um, when it comes to medications, like I said, uh, reviewing those, but also maybe taking a medicine for depression or anxiety. When it, uh, yoga and meditation, so studies suggest that meditating or doing yoga on a regular basis may help you feel less anxious. So you could call your local Y, senior center, nearby gym to find out if they offer yoga or meditation classes. Um, many do. Um, and, and you can also even find a lot of these resources in the form of um, like YouTube videos, DVDs, CDs, uh, which can be at libraries, bookstores, or even online. Um, for exercise, so I, it's really hard because when you're in this cycle of depression and lack of um, motivation um, or anxiety, which can also be with a lack of motivation, it's very hard to also fathom like now I, part of my prescription is to exercise, um, but there are really good endorphins that, that can come from exercise. So regular ex exercise, especially something repetitive like walking or swimming laps can help ease anxiety. 
And so it's important to make time for ex uh, regular exercise. We also know that um, if we, I always tell patients, like if we move the body, we move the mind. It's what we know can best help prevent um, uh, dementia. Um, you know, there's a lot, it's been many, many years since we've come out with a really good medicine for dementia. Um, but what we do know is that if you move the body, you move the mind and it's protective. Um, and then lastly on this slide, what I'll touch on is the deep, uh, slow breathing. So this is very much uh, for anxiety. So when people are anxious, they we tend to breathe uh, in this like, very shallow manner and even maybe hold our breath without realizing this. And this actually can put us into this cycle of becoming more anxious. And then we keep breathing the same way and then we become more anxious. So instead try like slow and deep breathing. And so um, the recommendation is to, to focus on the rib cage expanding or even sticking out each time you take a breath in, feel the breath leave your nostrils and over your top lip, and really just focusing on the breath itself. Um, if you feel anxious, you can try to find a place uh, where you can sit for a few minutes, close your eyes and do these activities. And there's also, again, a lot of videos, uh, I keep, I'll keep mentioning YouTube, but a lot of videos, CDs that can help um, expand and provide instructions on like soothing breathing, relaxation. Um, there's even, you can do like imagery, um, there's a guided imagery where you're picturing a more pleasant situation of a place, a time in your life um, that can be helpful. But these are skills, right? When you're practicing meditation or mindfulness or yoga or deep breathing, these are skills where we have to be kind to ourselves. When we notice we've gotten distracted, we come back and we're kind to ourselves when that happens. Um, but it's definitely this toolbox that we're trying to continually build um, these skills to do. Next slide. And so I, I really, I like this slide a lot. So they're by the World Health Organization, WHO. They define mental health as a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own capabilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. And I think this is really nice because really mental health is simply mental wellness. Um, oftentimes, if we say mental health, mental wellness, it gets confused with mental illness. Um, and then it comes the neg negative stigma around it. Um, and so looking at mental health as a mental wellness is a preventive measure to, uh, for, to possibly, um, uh, as a more of a preventive measure to try to, 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 um, be more mindful of how we're feeling, being able to speak to other people about it, and then seek the care and the, and the treatment and the support that we need. Next slide. Okay, so this link, I'm gonna put this link in the chat. Um, let me do this. Okay. So this is a help guide. So this slide here, it's a help guide through the six ways of mental health. And we're gonna elaborate on these uh, six areas on the next slides. And this is how we'll finish up our talk. Um, but this is uh, one of the top like mental health websites and it provides trustworthy content that helps to improve overall mental health. So on the next slide, we'll go over social connection. Perfect. So as humans, um, we are designed to be socially connected with others. I think we may have uh, seen this the most in the last two years uh, when we weren't able to do so, but we are meant to connect with others. We all have an emotional need for relationships, positive connections, and a sense of belonging. Um, phone calls and social networks uh, definitely have their place. Um, but again, I think in the last two years, we've learned that nothing really beats the power of quality face-to-face -face time with other people. And so the benefit of staying connected with others is that it can support our emotional health and prevent isolation. Um, it can, maintaining relationships and opening up to others can certainly be hard uh, for some. Um, the key is to interact with someone who is enjoyable, who's a good listener, um, and that being someone who'll listen to your feelings, to your feelings behind your words and won't inter uh, interrupt, judge, or criticize you. Um, here are some ways on the slide to stay socially connected. Um, so you could schedule time with loved ones. Um, you could join special interest groups, build new friendships with neighbors, coworkers. Um, uh, and then I, as we're doing this on Zoom, you can cut back on virtual connections, um, but, um, um, but you know, choose, uh, choose to give a call or a text, see someone in person um, to help with those connections. Next slide. 
Okay, we talked about this already, but staying active. So the recommendation is from the Institute of Medicine is for 150, 150 minutes of exercise a day. Um, by definition, exercise is something that um, exerts, is a physical exertion past your day-to-day -day life. Um, and so we know um, when physical health is improved, uh, we automatically experience greater mental and emotional well being. Um, physical activity also releases endorphins. Um, these are powerful chemicals that lift our, uh, our mood, they provide added energy. And so um, this comes up a lot. And again, it's, I think a lot of it is COVID as well. But in clinic, when I'm speaking to a lot of patients, it's the, it's the, extreme like fatigue and low motivation and just being tired all day long. And so therefore there's no exercise involved. And then we feel more tired and it's like, well, I didn't do anything. How am I tired? And I'm like, no, that's the problem, right? We need this movement. We need these exercises to relieve those, release those endorphins to add to the low, to, to the energy. Um, and so physical, regular physical exercise or activity can also relieve stress. It can improve memory, like I always say, like move your body, move your mind, and can help uh, with better sleep. Um, so a few tips would be, you know, starting off small um, and building your way back up, especially if a lot of your activities have been cut down from COVID, starting back up, but slow, pace yourself, um, and then do things that are fun. Um, it doesn't have to be like the classic, like working out or exercise. It can be dancing, camping, walking, gardening, um, anything that you find enjoyable. Next slide. Okay. So managing stress. So like I said, stress is a normal everyday part of life. Um, feeling nervous about something, feeling stressed about something, feeling sad about something is normal. Um, but we want to be able to control, right? Have that emotional or stress control. So stress takes a toll on the mental and emotional health. So it's important to keep it under control. Um, while not all stressors can be avoided, stress management strategies can help uh, bring things back into balance. Um, and so here in these boxes, you can see some of the ways in which uh, some like management techniques to consider. So talk to um, a friendly face, someone that you trust. Um, you can, um, you know, do things that appeal to your senses. What, what music do you like to listen to? Is there a, a pleasant scent? Is there a candle? Um, is there a stress ball? Is there a pet? Um, anything that can appeal to your senses. Um, and, uh, and when you think about like, you know, also taking time uh, for reflection and appreciation. So a lot of this has been like, get out, do things, move, but also be sure to take that time to have to yourself, to be able to reflect, to be able to think about, um, you know, whether it's through meditation, prayer, journaling, focusing on your thoughts um, and, and reflecting on that. And lastly, um, practicing relaxation. Um, so while, you know, sensory input can relieve stress in the moment, relaxation techniques, like I talked about deep breathing imagery, guided imagery can reduce overall stress. Um, and stress can have some damaging effects on the nervous system. And I, that also is connected a lot to pain. Um, and so to effectively combat stress, we need to activate our body's natural relaxation response. And so, um, doing those, those activities, deep breathing, meditation, yoga can help. Next slide. All right, brain healthy diet. So the diet on the left, eat these things, fruits, veggies, um, nuts, seeds, trying to avoid like heavily processed foods. So there are foods that can boost your, your mood. Um, so uh, fatty fish, like rich in omega threes can be helpful. Nuts, avocados, flaxseed, beans, leafy greens, um, just trying to stay as much as you can away from the, the highly processed foods. And then also trying to uh, monitor your caffeine intake as well as your alcohol intake. Next slide. Okay. So, um, and then when it comes to quality sleep, it's really important for your, for your mental health. So it's a necessity. It's not a luxury. Um, skipping even a few hours here and there can take a toll on your mood, your energy, your sharpness, um, and your ability to handle stress. And over the long-term chronic sleep loss uh, can have detrimental effects on your health. Um, it is recommended to get seven to nine hours. Um, and typically sleep does not come the moment someone lays their head down. The brain does need time to unwind at the end of the day. So just being sure that at, like having a, a nighttime routine that allows for the winding down, the relaxation. So the TV, the phone, the tablets, the computers um, uh, pushed aside and uh, working on more relaxation. 
I think what's really important to comment too is that there are normal expected um, sleep changes that occur as someone gets older, um, but typically those sleep changes don't actually cause a person to have distress. Um, and so if your sleep is causing you stress, if your sleep is causing you problems, like that's actually abnormal. And I would really recommend that you talk to your, to your provider. Next slide. All right, and the final point from that website I included on uh, in the chat is finding meaning and purpose in life. Um, so this could look different for everyone. You may think of it as a way to feel needed, feel good about yourself, a purpose that drives you on, or simply a reason to get out of the bed in the morning. Um, finding meaning and purpose is essential for brain health. Uh, it can help generate new cells, create stronger connections in the brain. And it can also strengthen your immune system. It can alleviate pain, relieve stress, and keep you motivated. Um, and so here are some good ways um, in terms of finding meaning and purpose. So caring for a pet, it certainly is a responsibility, but caring for one makes you feel needed and loved, and they're just wonderful. Um, there's no love <laughs> quite like the unconditional love of a pet. Um, also volunteering. So uh, just that it's our nature to be social, it's also in our nature to give to others. And so finding something in the community that provides you enrichment and helps expand your life and brings you enjoyment and a purpose uh, um, or like a or organization's purpose that really speaks to you um, could, could bring you a lot of that. Um, nurturing relationships. So spend time building these relationships, keeping these relationships strong. Um, and then lastly, engaging in work that provides meaning to you. So activities that challenge you. Um, uh, maybe I said there was a patient I was talking to recently, like we're just trying to reinvent um, her interest and, and what her purpose is going to be because her life has had some pretty big changes recently. And, and a lot of it when she turns doesn't seem to, she doesn't seem to recognize much of, of her life currently due to recent events. And so we're, we're, we're in the reinventing phase. Um, and so I think that's really important. Next slide. And then one more. Okay, they're going to go one by one. Um, so the, the, uh, and the key points, depression, anxiety it is a medical issue. It is not a normal part of aging. Um, please reach out to someone if you are concerned about your, your mood, your mind, the way you're thinking. Um, help can come from a lot of different sources. So lifestyle changes as well as treatment options, whether it's talking or through medication. And there are a variety of ways to support your mental health. And so it's really like I talk to patients about, it's your toolbox. And and we just fill the toolbox with what, what speaks to you, what you're able to do, what you enjoy doing, but building that toolbox so that when you feel that stress, when you feel that, that sense of depression or your, whatever your manifestation is of your depression, you can reach into that toolbox and that's what you're going to use in that moment. Um, so it's all about building the toolbox. Next slide. All right, I'm done talking. Um, <laughs> I don't know if there are questions in the chat. I can't, I can't multitask. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Janelle. So there's a time for a few questions from the audience before Dr. Landy has to leave. There was a question about uh, any additional thoughts about handling anxiety due to the current financial outlook in life, other than talking to your financial planner. Just on the making pun. Sorry, one second. Anxiety, depression, sure. stress, and making contact with the financial manager. Oh, like if the if the mood concerns are related to to finances. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There are so many resources. Um, I still I'm trying to wrap my head around them. We have wonderful social workers at the South Shore Senior Clinic who help with this. Um, there are wonderful either insurance or Department of Aging ways to layer in um uh, support. So that way it can perhaps offload a little bit of what's coming out of pocket. Um, and so if you have access to a social worker or case manager, or I, I, I'm trying to think of other, other places that could help, but it's more so what we end up doing in clinic is we end up just trying to layer in areas so that instead of, you know, someone paying for blank, well, now department of aging has stepped in for that. And so that has been freed up now. I don't, I don't know if that's helpful. No, I think those, those are good suggestions. Layering um, I see one about the 150 minutes. Yes, thank you, per week. I mean, 150 <laughs> minutes per week. <laughs> Great. How can, Great. Like, 
be healthy depression, especially. Yes, I've actually, sorry, this page, was, um, I have um, actually recommended this for patients, especially with the seasonal depression or seasonal mood disorders, um, having light therapy. So I, I would try it. It's, I think it comes down to one of those things where it, will it have benefit? I don't, you know, we don't know. Um, it's different for everyone, but is there harm associated? Not so much. And so it's one of those things where if I'm talking with a patient, I think it's worth a shot because I don't know that there's much harm associated, but if we get benefit, that's fantastic. Um, well, my question also is even more detailed. Uh, I've seen in uh, pharmacies and even at Walmart and Target, they're now carrying light boxes. How, how does one know what to buy and how to use them? That is a fantastic question. And I don't know if I know the answer off the top of my head, but I'm happy to find it and send it out. That's a really good question. Yeah, you like walk in, you're like, okay, now I have a bunch of options. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, they range in, from $10 to $75. So <laughs> it's a yeah. range of prices. So who knows what to buy and how to use them? Yeah, I'll look at that. It's a really good question, actually, because here I am just saying like, yeah, sure. Try light therapy to my patients. And then I'm not even thinking about what happens when they encounter the shelf with all of them. Um, I'll look into it because it's just like a lot of other uh, medical equipment, I guess we can call it um, blood pressure cuffs, right? You walk in, you're like, which blood pressure cuff do I buy? Um, and it turns out we have a list for that. So um, I'll look into that and I'll send it out. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Any other questions? either in the chat or feel free to raise your hand. Sarah has a recommendation. Yeah, she's she recommending Verilux is a good, bland, good brand of light therapy. Good to know. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, light therapy. I, was, I found a really good YouTube video that explained it because it's confusing when you look at it because there can be some damage to eyes apparently and I was concerned about that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to see if I can find it again, but my eyes are really bad. So <laughs> it's hard to find in my mail, Yeah, um, but they're out there. Okay. Um, and it's, it's confusing, but Verilux I know is a good, is a reliable brand. Thank you. That's really helpful. I wrote it down. I'm making a note for myself. Other questions? Well, uh, Janelle, you want to you want to uh, wrap up? Absolutely. Thank you all so much for your participation, your engagement, your really great responses and questions. And again, thank you to Dr. Landy for taking the time out to present such a very thorough, um, precise, knowledgeable um, presentation to us. So we really appreciate that, Dr. Landy. And I just wanna ask that you guys will take a moment to complete our participant survey. The participant survey asks just a few questions about your demographics, about how much you enjoyed the presentation, or even if you didn't enjoy it, if you have some suggestions <laughs> for us to add to the presentation and make it better. This survey really helps us to know the work that we're doing, the impact that it's having, and any further changes that we can make to our presentations. 